Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody got some lunch. If you didn't, or if you would like seconds, please feel free to get up and help yourselves. My name is Pat Kelleher, and I have the privilege of being the president and CEO of Family and Community Resources. Um, but for, before we get started with today's exciting presentation, um, I want to thank our sponsors. First of all, Jitten Hotel Management, who was kind enough to offer um, the use of this space and who has been a big supporter of our agency, to um, Beth Shera, who's on my board, who is vice president of Jitten, um, and her team, Pratit, and I'm going to ruin this last name, Sekira, Kerry, oh, and Brittany. I'm sorry, <laughs> and Matt Amaralt, who is also always our tech guy every time we have a fundraiser to National Grid, to our luncheon sponsor, Hawkeye Fence, and to our um, friends from Signature Healthcare. So thank you very much to all of those folks who made this um, possible for us today. Um, one of my staff typed out all of these notes and statistics that she wanted me to read. Um, and I'm not, I'm sorry, Linda, but I'm not going to read them. Um, and I know you spent a lot of time doing it and putting this together, so thank you to you and Joanne Hoops, the director of my development department, also for doing this today. Um, Family and Community Resources is an agency that's been around for 50 years. During those 50 years, we've sort of evolved um, into an agency that now provides a continuum of services. I like to think of it as one-stop shopping for survivors of all different types of trauma. It can be you had a fire in your home, you're, you witnessed um, violence in the community, a student witnessed violence in the school, they were a victim of bullying, so on and so forth. But our largest program is for survivors of victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. Back in 1991, when we first started the domestic violence program, it was because the agency thought they saw a rise in the increase of domestic violence cases that were coming to them for services through their mental health clinic. Actually, what it was was the country started to take notice of what was going on and how many victims there were that were coming forward for services. So, and victims were finally being able, being referred to agencies that could provide them with the resources that they needed. That today, Family and Community Resources has grown into an agency that provides individual group and family support services for survivors and their children. We provide services in about six different languages. We have a child witness to violence program that I think is probably one of the saddest programs we have for little kids aged two and a half up to 18 or 19 who witness violence at home, school, or in their community. We have the, actually the countries largest supervised visitation center, both for children who come from homes where they've witnessed violence or violence has occurred between their biological parents, um, or we have a second program for supervised visitation for kids who are in out-of-home placement. Many of those children not only have witnessed violence in their home, but have also suffered the abuses of parents who suffer from substance abuse. Over the last two years in that program, Nine of our parents have died as a result of the opiate crisis. So when we bring this to you today, it's because many of the survivors that come to us also work. A high, very high percentage of those women who come to us and those men who are in our, one of our 15 groups for offenders of domestic violence and we provide those services in three different languages, both in the Brockton area, for Cape, for the Cape area and actually for Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. And I know nobody thinks there's any domestic violence on Nantucket. Let me assure you, there is. And it increases in Nantucket in the summer when all of the wealthy people go there. <clears throat> because domestic violence happens in everyone's home. Doesn't make any difference whether you are of a lower economic or in the high economic bracket. But I wanted to tell you a story about a victim. When I was an advocate, first started out as an advocate at this agency, there was a woman who came to us for services, who a little Cape Verdean woman 
who worked for a dry cleaner in one of the smaller towns. Not only could she not take time off from work because she couldn't afford it, she was, her um, husband at the time was taking all of her money, and she, he would know in her paycheck if she had taken a day off. Um, she was just scared to death to leave where she worked because it was this one safe place for her. So we got a call from her employer asking if someone could help her. And we said, sure, you know, we can schedule an appointment, she can, you know, the routine, you can come in for an intake, blah, 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 blah. That was not going to work. So we made arrangements that one day a week, or as needed, an advocate would go to the cleaners, the boss would come in and cover the front desk, and we would meet with her to try and help her, empower her to make the decisions that she needed to make to keep herself and her children safe. If it had not been for that employer, I fully believe that woman would not be here with us today. So for all of you who are here, and I'm so happy to see men in the audience because we cannot end this unless men help us to take responsibility for violence against women and children. But thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedules. Thank you for taking the information home with you. Please listen carefully, write down any questions you might have for the end, because I heard many, I've heard all of these people before, but I had the pleasure of hearing some of them at a presentation at Suffolk University. And after being in this field for over 30 years, it's amazing what you can learn from the experts. So thank you all for being here. At this point, I would like to, um, this is the, I get nervous introducing this woman. Um, you know, all of us who have watched the news and listened to the news, it's always a big deal when you meet a celebrity, so. Um, we're very happy to have Kim <coughs> Carrigan here with us today. She's one of Boston's most popular TV and radio news anchors and a strong advocate for victims of domestic violence, and you're going to hear and see why shortly. She currently hosts Boston's morning show on WRKO AM 680, before transitioning to the radio, Kim's television news career brought her from the Midwest to Boston. Thank thankfully, she came to us. She served as an evening news anchor at WHDH-TV and WBZ-TV before moving to Fox 25 to co-anchor the Fox 25 Morning News. Kim donates her time to support a variety of charitable organizations, including the Northeast Arc, Catholic Charities, Boston Bakes for Breast Cancer, and many other worthy, ca worthy causes. So again, thank you all for coming today. And I'm happy to introduce you to Kim Carrigan. Thank you all so much. It's always so strange when people read about what you've done with your life and you feel like, wow, am I dead? <laughs> I always feel so odd. It's great to be here with you today, and I am so thrilled that the room is full. We so appreciate that. Pat and I actually came in contact during that, that event uh, at Suffolk, and uh, I was lucky enough to be a part of that, doing the exact same thing, moderating the panel there, some of these um, panel members on that panel as well. Uh, my first exposure to this whole issue came when I was asked to narrate a video for Employers Against Domestic Violence. And you know, like so many people, I never really thought about the idea that domestic violence can be so impactful in the workplace. It's impactful on the workplace itself, the people who work there, and certainly on the individual who is going through such a difficult time in their life. I think today you'll learn a lot from the people who are here on our panel. And uh, as Pat mentioned, if you'll jot down any kinds of questions you have, we'll definitely open it up at the end so it gives you an opportunity to engage uh, with these terrific uh, experts here. So let me introduce our panel first off, and we want to get started immediately. Let's start all the way down there at the end. And uh, our lone male, and we so appreciate him being on the panel today, this is Tom Kearney. He is Vice President of Human Resources at Eastern Bank Corporation. Next is Jennifer Duke. She is an attorney with Littner uh, Mendelssohn. She is also on the EADV board in Boston. Again, that's the Employers Against Domestic 
domestic violence. As we move down closer to me now, we have Laverne Gordon, and she's the founder of Live Life Now. She's also a domestic violence survivor. And finally, right here to my right is Kelly Dwyer. She's the executive director of the Governor's Council on Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence. So we say thank you to all of them for being here today. So the first thing that we want to do uh, is open this up for Laverne. I would like to give her an opportunity to talk a little bit about her experience and about putting together this incredible organization. And I remind you that it's not easy to talk about your own personal experience and certainly not one uh, like this. So we very much appreciate her being here and being able to share that story. So I'm going to open it up to you, ma'am. Thank you, Kim. First of all, thank you guys for being in the room. This issue does not go anywhere without um, you being present to hear about the ways that you can be part of the solution. Uh, as Kim mentioned, my name is Laverne. I am the founder of Love Life Now Foundation, and we promote year-round awareness against domestic violence. Uh, I came to this work because, I, as Kim mentioned, I am a survivor of domestic violence. I am a child witness to it. Uh, growing up in a home in Trinidad, uh, I was born in 77, but knew myself in the 80s, really. Um, and for the entire time that I lived on the island, uh, domestic violence was a, a flagrant part of my upbringing. Uh, my father brutally abused my mother. And when we talk about abuse that we witnessed, there was five of us, I was the middle child. When we talk about the abuse I witnessed, it was um, anywhere from him using machetes on her, uh, to him breaking beer bottles and stabbing her with. And I am blunt about the type of abuse that we witness because this is what it is for a lot of people. Um, and again, you tell yourself, for me at least, I continually said that would never be me. I would never let anybody treat me the way my father treated my mother. Um, unfortunately for children that grow up in domestic violence homes, they go on to be uh, the victims or the abuser. I was no exception to the rule and became a victim. Uh, when I met the gentleman uh, that was my abuser, uh, I was um, 21, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and going to Suffolk University at night. And I had my first corporate America job. Uh, I worked around the Fenway area. So, um, for the first three months, things were fantastic. Uh, there were signs that I neglected um, because I, I, couldn't, I couldn't really grasp the fact that this person was so in love with me. Um, unfortunately, about three months in, the first slap happened. And after he slapped me and stormed out, I sat there saying to myself that, what, you know, what did I do? What did I do to deserve that? And really and truly, after about three minutes, I, I had to get myself together because I said, I didn't do anything. That was on him, and I'm done. When victims are in relationships like this, we tend to sort of gloss over, like I said, the immediate signs. And the very next sign that I got was the elaborate apology. I was gone for about a weekend to New York and came back, and um, my brother, who was room sitting for me at the time, this is in the States because my mother, my father had let my mother go after many years, and um, we lived at my grandparents' house. And so my brother was room sitting for me, and he said, You know, you're pretty popular around here. And I walked in because my abuser had delivered two dozen purple roses, my favorite color, and had left a barrage of messages on my phone, very worried that I hadn't called or checked in, and that he was very, very sorry for what had happened. I took that apology, which turned into two years of ongoing abuse, physical, verbal, emotional. And again, at the time I worked at a, uh, in a corporate America setting, and he, would many times call my job um, to find out what I was doing, um, whether or not I was available for lunch, and uh, if I had missed one of his calls and his calls went to voicemail, he'd be very irate in the next one once he got a hold of me. Well, on particular days when he showed up, because he worked in the area as well, 
when he showed up I mean, unannounced a lot of the time and met me on the first floor. I worked on the second floor of this building. He would barrage me with insults. He would barrage me with accusations. Um, you know, why are you wearing this dress? It's too short. Who are you trying to pick up in this office? Are you talking to someone else? Why didn't you pick up my call earlier? Um, was it because you were on the line with someone else? Uh, you know, what kind of underwear are you wearing today? A thong? Are you crazy? I mean, he would hike up my dress in the hallways. Uh, he would strangle me if it, the response wasn't fitting to what he was looking for. He would slap me. Um, he would grab me by the arm. And after these attacks, I would go back to my desk, but first visit the bathroom to clean myself up because I didn't want my office to see any sign of what had just happened. Um, our office was an open setting. There were no cubicles, there were no walls, but a bunch of desks grouped together by departments. So anybody could look at you from directly across the room and see you. And I was too afraid that people would see me, like see me, what was really going on behind everything that I was trying to cover up. One day he called, and he was so irate that I had to cover the phone because I didn't want my employer to hear him yelling and screaming. People ask a lot of the time, why don't you just leave? And when you work, in any setting, that's your only source of income. How do you go to your boss and report that you are getting beat up, not just at home, but at your place of work? How do you do that? The shame that is associated with this issue too often keeps people in the shadows from speaking up. It certainly kept me. I wondered, what would they think about me? I was the minority at my job. I was one of two black women. And a lot of the times, as black women, we hear, you bring drama. They are drama. They are ghetto. Everything under the sun made me think that I would lose my job because I didn't know and because I didn't speak up. Ten years later, after I had decided to start the foundation, I finally opened up to my boss on a car ride to a networking event. She was dumbfounded. She couldn't believe half the things that I had told her that happened to me on the job site. She said, why did you say something? I would have supported you. And my response to her was, not only was I a minority in race, I was a minority in gender. Our office was made up mostly of men. And in my thinking, if she had divulged, which I thought she would have done, divulged to any one of the higher-ups that this was happening to me, that they would have opted for me to be fired. I looked at myself as a liability. A liability to take time off work to go file a restraining order, which I essentially did at the very, very end. When I got to my breaking point and decided that I wanted this relationship no more, that my life mattered more, he started stalking me. Showing up at my apartment building, which I then moved to later on, leaving a nasty note on my car for my neighbors to see. And I was advised that you need to file a restraining order because this is a dangerous time. 
So I did. But I lied to my job. I said I was sick just to take time off to go to court to file said restraining order. This is what victims face every day. And so, Love Life Now came about after I took part in two beauty pageants that I was due to take part in. One locally that I ended up winning, and I had to go on to the Nationals in LA, and I won there as well. But then I was faced with having a platform to use my voice for, and domestic violence was an easy choice. After the year was up with said platform, I knew I wasn't a pageant girl, but I really wanted to continue this work. And so Love Life Now was created. Seven years later, we are not a shelter, we're not an agency, but we point people in the right direction for help. When I ended up at my breaking point in the ER of Cardi Hospital, after the worst beating I had got, the first time that I had sought any sort of help, I lied and I said that I fell in the shower. The ER doctor said, these injuries are not consistent with you falling in the shower. I can help you. But help to me meant getting the police involved. Help to me meant my job finding out. Help to me meant my school finding out. And I wanted none of that. I wanted to go home, the most dangerous place to be, and just be done with it. So now it is my duty, if nothing else, to tell people or to help people understand what help looks like. So that that myth and that stereotype and the shame and the blame that we put on ourselves as victims is no more. We have worked with FCR over the years to try and point people in the right direction for help because we bring awareness to shelters, not just FCR, but all of the agencies that are doing really great work on the front lines because people think what I think, what I thought at the time, I should say, was that I was help meant that I was going to go to a big open room with beds with a bunch of women that I didn't know. And I didn't want that. These agencies offer pertinent help that can really guide a victim to being a survivor and a thriving one. So that's my story. Thank you. Laverne, thank you very, very much. And we'll talk more with her, obviously, <clears throat> throughout the course of, uh, of our program here. What I'd like to do, uh, now that we've sort of set the tone for the direction that we're headed in, I'd like to hear from each of our panelists just a quick overview of how your particular position fits into our conversation today. So if it would be OK, we'll start right here with you, Kelly. Um, good afternoon. Sharing your story, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I just want to start out to uh, first acknowledge that to date, since January of 2018, there has been 13 domestic violence homicides here in, in Massachusetts. One is far too many. Um, so my role as the executive director, which I started back in uh, February of this year, so I've hit the ground sprinting. Um, was to essentially work through the current domestic, or the current two, 2018 work plan, which was created by my predecessor. And within that work plan, um, we have five different work groups, housing stability and self-sufficiency, military veterans and families, child um, trafficking, assessment and response, and prevention education. And we actually recently added an additional one um, due to the increase in the budget under CPH for $500,000 for an awareness campaign. Um, so that had actually kicked off this past Friday. Um, within that, it, you know, it, it, one of the things that we had done in our first year, which was actually prior to my arrival, was to look at um, Chapter 260, which was the legislation that was passed back in uh, 2014. 
Um, and so I had write down, written, written down some notes just to make sure that I you know, had everything, um, especially since that was prior to my arrival. Um, and one of the things that they did was um, when the, it was directly after the governor had signed the executive order back in uh, 2015, uh, so they had created essentially different work groups to break down the legislation. And so um, within that legislation, we do have a report that was filed, which is on mass.gov, so please feel free to take a look at it. And uh, through the council's work, we're able to ensure progress within 49 actionable items within the legislation. Some of the examples include the trial court, new electronic docketing systems that captures all DD related crimes, um, domestic violence education task force to establish to create an online domestic violence training, which has already been implemented and utilized, um, and all court personnel has been trained on it. And then additionally, they have done um, updates within the law enforcement guidelines um, and some of the other things that have related to a lot of you know, education, training, and awareness. Um, part of that was uh, particularly related to the leave for domestic violence victims. Um, and within that, it provided up to 15 days of leave within a year for employees to address issues related to violence, uh, including obtaining medical attention, accessing courts, and receiving counseling and support services. Um, it also delineates a notification process to employers and affords the employee or employer with the option of whether to pay the individual or not while on leave. Um, the, elite, the leave is enforced by the Attorney General's office, which they do partner with us at the council. Um, some of the major takeaways from the law are uh, the 15 days. Uh, the statute contains important de definitions of abuse, which include uh, abusive behavior, domestic violence, family members, and other terms. Uh, it also provides the same leave to employees who, who need the time off from work due to the abuse of a covered family member, spouse, child, parent, grandparent, etc., as so long as the employee is not the perpetrator of the crime. So additionally, um, some of the other major takeaways are uh, providing the employer with the advance notice, uh, notifying each employee of the employee's rights and responsibilities. But I do believe, you know, based upon this, and you know, especially with our recent meeting with the awareness campaign, it's also changing the culture and how you operate within the workplace. So I think it just goes beyond the law itself and how you, how you train your employees in order to identify and respond. But then also, you're changing that culture. You're saying we are taking this very seriously and we will support you if, if God forbid, anything were to arise and you need, you need support through that. Um, so I think that you know, education, awareness, and, and essentially changing the culture in every um, aspect of the line of work. We actually currently, this week, uh, are in the midst of our OBCT tech training with the Military Veterans and Families Work Group. And a correlation of that is that your mission readiness, right? So you're experiencing violence, and you're afraid to go you know, to your boss, and you're afraid to go because that individual that you're experiencing violence from comes from your unit, so that essentially your unit is not mission ready, and that you don't feel comfortable or confident enough in going to your commander in, in the fear of retaliation or essentially losing your job. Um, so I think that essentially, I mean, taking the domestic violence laws or the laws that are in place, but then educating yourself, educating your staff um, to be able to change that culture and to support those uh, people that are going through that trauma. I don't know if I just did a little too much. No, that's okay. You're good. <laughs> well, I think what's fascinating about this, and, and I, this is something that over the course of my interaction I've learned, and that's that we do have laws, and there are many people who maybe are not familiar with those laws, and if you're an employer or you're an HR person, these are the kinds of things that you certainly need to be familiar with. But what I have found the most fascinating about it is the change of culture in a workplace. Because it's one thing to have laws, it's another for everyone in your workplace to know it and to embrace it. Uh, because that's what these people need. They need the embrace of the people around them. So thank you very much. Speaking of employers, we're going to jump down to, to Tom Kearney here, because he represents 
sense that portion uh, of this panel because he is with Eastern Bank. So let's let's uh, learn a little bit more about uh, how all of this impacts him and impacts their workplace. Go ahead, Tom. Great. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Great. Um, absolutely. This is this is an issue that uh, all employers should be cognizant of and, and, and absolutely have to pay attention to. I, 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 some of the things that uh, I experience uh, from my role, my role is I'm an HR business partner. So what I want to do is share with you some of the real practical day-to-day, -day, what, what really absent happens, the, the, the laws are in place, um, but how do they actually work and how do they how do the employees actually come to us? And what are some of the things that, that we see and how do we react to them and how do we coach our managers on, on, these, on these particular issues? So what I want to do today is hopefully share my experiences, um, what, uh, what might be best practices, but also I want to learn from you too. So from the audience, if, if you have things to share, uh, please, please do it when we get to the Q&A. Portion, um, I think that that's really important. Um, uh, there's no uh, one right answer um, in some cases, so I, I think that's really important. Um, some things I want to share uh, today, uh, first, is some of the symptoms that we see when when domestic violence kind of comes into the workplace. And uh, Laverne was kind of talking. We chatted a little earlier, and and I was saying, you know, one of the things that we don't see a lot of. And it's one of the symptoms, though, is uh, the, the symptoms of physical abuse, um, bruising, uh, uh, the crying, uh, being physically upset. Um, that's actually not one of the more common things that you see. And you can, after listening to Liberum, you can see why. Um, they're, they, they want their privacy, they're afraid it's going to affect their career. It's, it's clear that that's, that's a significant issue to overcome, and to overcome it, um, as we were just talking, it's culture, um, the culture of your organization, and being able uh, to, to support your, your employees in a way that they feel comfortable coming to you. Um, one of the, the most prevalent things that I see um, is with, uh, with performance. Um, if there's a performance or decline in somebody, or an erratic performance, usually it's coupled with or attendance, um, and, and often the first thing the manager does, um, and and I, I have to work with the manager on these things, is their their goals and their incentives are driven around productivity. And when they see somebody declining in productivity, what's the first thing they do? They start asking the wrong questions uh, initially. Um, the the first questions they're asking are, what what do we have to do to get this person up to speed? Um, or, or what do I have to do to move this person along? Um, and that's not the right question. Um, and what I do, um, and I think this is a, a really good practice for HR folks to, if you're out there, is coach them on asking the right questions, which is the why. What's the, what's the source of the issue? And I'm telling you, it comes across more empathetic, more understanding, um, and the person's going to be more willing to, to work with you and come forward. And, and it's, it's only really at that point we can, we can help them. Um, so I, I think that's really an important point to, to make and, and something a good takeaway um, with, with what I do. A um, couple of other ways that I find out, um, and it usually when it surfaces to me, it's, it's kind of uh, later in the game. Um, it, um, it's the employee coming to me, and there are really two main reasons it's coming to me. The first is that the violence has escalated to the point where they're actually concerned um, that it's going to travel with them to work. Mm -hmm. um, they're concerned for their coworkers too. They're not sure what their the the abuser is going to do, um, and it's at that point that it's escalated to that point where. They, they overcome how they feel, and then they come to me and say, I, I need help. Um, and if you look at the statistics, and I've been kind of reviewing some of them in advance of, of today, 60% um, of domestic violence occurs between the hours of 7 and 6 a.m. So if you think about that, that means 
40% occurs during what's traditionally your work day. So that means it's happening. And whether we choose to acknowledge it or not, um, it's happening. And it's, it's something that actually we do need to pay attention to. And, and, and Laverne is actually, it's a, a, thank you for sharing that. That was incredibly helpful. Um, the other way, um, or the other reason that, that um, uh, the employee will come to us is, I, I call it, um, I'm not sure if this is a technical term, but it's, it's like an economic um, uh, influence or an economic impact. Um, the, the abuser will often attack the employee, and I've actually had this happen um, multiple times, where the abuser is actually going to um, different compliance agencies or and making false complaints to destroy the career of that person. Um, and the employee feels so threatened that that's their economic, that's how they survive. They may have children and they have to do something. Um, so they want to get ahead of it. And it's at that point they, they approach me and say, I've, I've got this issue, I want you to be aware of it and I, I, need, I need help. And it actually it's incredibly helpful um, because if they don't, um, then when we find out after, then there's a significant investigation and, and process that we, we have to go through. Um, so the, the, I, I just wanted to share a couple of, of those things with you. And one of the, the things that our security, head of security always says to me, he says, you don't want to be finding out about these kinds of events at halftime. Because at halftime, it's escalated to the point where it's really dangerous. Um, and it's dangerous for everybody, the employee and the other folks in the workforce. So um, I'll, I'll be happy to share. I'm going to share some more a little bit later, but um, I can uh, uh, turn it over. Um, Absolutely. Thank you, sir, very much. We're just going to let Jennifer jump in here. Um, Jennifer, and if you'll quickly just give us a sense of, Jennifer is an attorney, uh, of, of where you stand in all of this, and then we've got some specific questions for each of our panelists. So go ahead. Sure. So hi, everybody. Um, as Kim mentioned, my name is Jennifer Duke. I'm an attorney at Littler Mendelssohn, where I advise uh, employers on how to navigate the complex web of employment laws, including the ones we're talking about today, like the act relative to domestic violence leave. Um, I've been on the board of Employers Against Domestic Violence for four years now. Uh, so I've been trying to promote awareness among employers and HR professionals, general counsels, et cetera. Um, and uh, it's lovely to to meet people like Tom who take these issues so seriously and are really trying to uh, take steps to deal with these issues proactively in the workplace. So as an employment attorney, um, and I have experience um, on, a, on a pro bono level representing uh, survivors of domestic violence and obtaining restraining orders. So these issues are very important to me uh, on a personal level. But as an employment attorney, um, my job is to um, counsel employers on the legal exposure that they um, may face, um, but not just uh, worrying about you know what kind of trouble and how much money are we going to have to pay you know if if we get into um, this situation if an employee you know, sues us, uh, for instance, for uh, violating the Domestic Violence Leave Act. I, uh, what we try to do, and I try to do specifically, is make sure that the employers and HR professionals are getting the right legal advice to make the right decisions in the first place. Um, and there are a whole host of uh, laws aside from the Domestic Violence Leave Act that employers should be aware of as intersecting um, with these issues. And uh, there isn't enough time in this specific panel to go over all of them, but we have um, the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. So a lot of times the uh, physical violence um, 
it's, even if it's happening, we don't necessarily see it like Laverne and Tom have been talking about, but there are a lot of symptoms like anxiety, PTSD, depression, which you wouldn't necessarily even be able to see with your own eyes. So those um, may be qualifying disabilities where in addition to providing leave or sick leave, um, this may trigger um, the, the need for FMLA leave, it may trigger uh, the, uh, the obligation to go through an interactive process with the employee uh, if you notice that something may be going on and uh, offer an accommodation, um, whether it's they, they need to go to mental health counseling or what have you. Uh, and then there's OSHA, like, like Tom Laverne are saying, uh, these are safety issues. You want to keep your workforce safe, in particular the victim, but also when the abusers tend to be uh, coming to the workplace whether unannounced or uninvited, uh, and, and perhaps stalking, um, this can create a, a known danger that the employer is then um, obligated to take seriously and take steps to prevent uh, dangerous situations from occurring. So uh, there's a whole range of issues um, that are uh, relevant to uh, domestic violence when it uh, comes into the workplace. And I just wanted to make a uh, note um, quickly that there is a, a flyer over in the table in the corner. Um, my firm, we have lots of resources for employers and HR professionals on different topics like disability and leave laws or updated laws that come through. So if you wanted to fill that out and leave it there for me, um, I can get you on that uh, list, so I just want to say that before I forget. But overall, you know, we want our employers to be productive, um, to maintain their productivity, but mainly to do the right thing. And if you, guess what? If you don't do the right thing, you are going to get into legal trouble, and that really affects the company's bottom line as well. It's it's an unbelievably complex issue. Um, because you're looking at it from so many different directions, obviously. Uh, keeping your workplace safe, keeping your employees safe, uh, keeping that, as you were saying, you know, just that, that whole uh, mentality within your workplace uh, in a positive place. Uh, we've heard from each one of these panelists, it's 2 o'clock already. I, this is an issue, right? We could be here for a month and probably not get through everything. So what I'd like to do is I have a question for each one of our panelists. I'm going to ask each one. I'll have to ask you guys to stay brief so that we can allow um, our, our members here to get uh, involved, our audience members. And I'm sorry for that. It's just, again, this is a complex issue that I think we, we could take a lot of time with. Let me get started. The first thing I want to do is I want to address this to Tom. Being an employer, you talked about some of the issues that you've seen, some of the ways that you've tried to address this. How about some of the things that you, as an employer, would say don't do? Things you want to stay away from? For sure. Yeah, I mean, there are, uh, we kind of touched on them a little bit. Um, one of the things that I, I talk to our managers about is um, don't try to solve the problem. Um, to, if, if you do not you don't have the expertise. Um, you, you really need to, to go to uh, a, a, a refer the person to someone who can advocate for them, counsel them, but you're not the expert. And it actually could be really dangerous. Um, managers can sometimes say, well, this is what I would do. Um, and you know, the person is in a vulnerable state and they may actually do something that they really shouldn't do, and you've just put them in significant danger. Um, so be very, very cautious and aware of, of those kinds of things, and that's one of the things we talked to our manager about. The other, and, and I'll tell a quick story, I know we we're short on time, but it, I think it's significant. Um, uh, don't, um, don't get so involved um, to the point where you're, um, you're, you're basically living the issue with the employee. And, and I'll give you a quick story. I had an, a, a manager who used to work for us. He went to another organization, um, had an employee there. She was going through a divorce. Um, he was 
doing everything he could to help her, he's working with her, uh, the spouse or ex-spouse, um, he, uh, he thinks that, he, that this gentleman's having an affair with his wife. Um, and he then, uh, essentially he, he tracks the, the gentleman, follows him to work, and then ultimately killed him at, at work. Um, this happened uh, about 10 years ago. It's a true story. Um, and it does happen, um, and it, it, it can have tragic results. And, and, and again, the best advice I can give to the manager is don't, actually I'm not telling you what not to do, but don't, don't give advice that you, you really aren't prepared to. Give the best advice you could do is refer them to actually HR, so we can actually refer them to employee assistance, which I have a little part here. So that's, that's the, uh, the approach that I would recommend. Laverne, this is for you. Uh, I know you've advocated for a number of individuals who have dealt with domestic violence and their employer, and no doubt you have run into employees who have been fearful that they are going to lose their job. Have you actually seen court cases where the employer went down the wrong road and someone had to go and fight for that employment? No, I haven't. Um... But we often, as you mentioned, we do, we, we do run into employees that are faced with, you know, at the, they're at the point where they have to file a restraining order or have to seek help because it's gotten that dangerous. And they won't or they would choose not to because they are fearful of losing time from work, losing hours, losing pay because they have responsibilities. And so we direct them in the direction of the, the DV uh, Law Act um, and ensure them that the, you know, the law is on your side. It's not like um, you know, prior to the act being in place where you had no resource whatsoever. Um, you know, and if we also, if they are not comfortable with sort of bringing that up with their employer because they, again, they think, you know, if I even bring the idea of me losing a day from work, I'll get fired. Um, you know, we tell them or refer them to a domestic violence agency where advocates can speak on their behalf. Um, and I think that is one of the best things, as Tom mentioned, that you can do as an employer is to direct them um, in the direction of an, an agency like FCR, where they can pick up the phone and advocate for them on their behalf. So it's not just, it's not coming from you, it's coming from someone that is, an, like you said, an expert in this area. So. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I haven't because that would be very hard. So, Kelly, I'm going to go to you now. And on the heels of that, it seems to me, though, uh, many people may not come forward in their workplace because of that fear. And their issue is that they don't have knowledge. I mean, why would you have knowledge about domestic abuse laws and your rights as a victim? Because none of us ever anticipates that we're going to be a victim. So this comes back to your awareness campaigns. And it seems to me within a corporation, there should be actual in-house awareness. Does, is that something that you guys advocate and can help employers do? So, I, you know, it's, it's been interesting um, being at the position that I'm at now because I've been in the direct service provider position um, for most of my career on both the military and civilian side. And I think, you know, the major takeaways that I've seen um, at, in my current position now is that awareness, is that education, and is that collaboration. I mean, those are the three kind of main things that I see across the board. And I think that, you know, especially with um, the Lieutenant Governor, I mean, she's chair of, of the council, and she's very excited and passionate um, in this world, but then also, <coughs> you know, with the awareness campaign and what that could look like. Um, and even though I don't have the details since we just kicked it off now and it probably won't be launched until the spring of next year, I'm very excited to start, you know, having those conversations. And I think that, you know, if you, it, it, it's already in the news. We're already having these conversations. It's already, you know, it, the time is now um, to continue those conversations. and. Um, within the workplace, I think, you know, it, it's up to um, the managers to work with their staff to essentially ed educate them on their rights. Um, and, you know, the HR and, and HR being a big part of it in doing that education piece. 
But then also, you know, partnering with your local agencies if maybe you're not comfortable and have them come in and do trainings. I mean, we have, you know, built-in resources within our communities. So leveraging those, <coughs> those resources and working with your partners uh, within your communities, are, it's going to be huge. I mean, in just the uh, sexual assault and domestic violence realm, uh, for those of you that, you know, work in that space, we see a high turnover rate. So training for us is huge. And then additionally, with things changing, technology changing, things like that, we always have to learn and adapt um, and, and, and continue our professional development. And I think that same goes for um, you know, the, just the regular, regular corporate world, and including you know, for me being a veteran on the military side. Um, and it, education is huge, and I think collaboration is, is you know, also big too. Mm -hmm. And finally, Jennifer, my last question for you today is related to the legal side of this. Is there a legal obligation on the part of the employer to make sure that the employees are aware of their rights? Yes. So under the um, Act uh, relative to domestic violence, um, all employers do have to post um, a notice about the, that particular law. So this could be posted in a public space um, at, at your um, you know, local offices. Uh, I highly recommend having a policy in place um, in the handbook, uh, even, even if you're not technically required under the law to have uh, that type of policy. For instance, if you're a smaller employer and the law doesn't technically apply, I strongly recommend having a policy because we hear time and time again that um, our survivors don't know that there's any structure in place at the company um, where, where they have any protection. But I also agree with everyone here who has recommended some kind of in-house training for their workforce, for instance, bystander training, so that you learn about what, uh, what the dynamics of domestic violence look like, um, how to notice when your coworker might be going through something but is, is too afraid to mention it. Um, and maybe they can confidentially speak with someone like Tom in HR, and, and then you know, he could find a way to approach um, that person. Uh, so there are a whole host of things you can do, including uh, putting together a security team, a, a workforce who's ready if some um, domestic violence emergency or workplace violence emergency generally uh, is arising, you have people who are prepared. Um, so definitely having the HR people and the workforce as a whole uh, get educated, reaching out to uh, employment counsel on these issues, reaching out to um, the police authorities uh, if, if there's a true emergency. Um, there are many, many things that employers can do to, to make their employees aware of their rights, but also to be prepared to help them. And can I ask you, Jennifer, just real quickly here, what about in, the employee's rights, or what is the obligation for an employee who recognizes that their coworker is going through something and the coworker's not coming forward? Or what happens if the coworker comes to you as a, as a coworker, not, not a boss, not the manager, and says, this is happening to me, but I don't want to tell them? What, what, does that coworker have any kind of responsibility, any kind of rights, any kind of protection there? Sure, well, uh, uh, there's a couple different things. So if you're a coworker who learns of this, you're a peer of the employee who's going through the situation, you're not necessarily under some type of legal obligation to, to escalate the issue, but in practice it is a really good idea to confidentially you know, bring it to HR. Um, you know, not gossip about it, of course, or do anything uh, intrusive, uh, but uh, if you're noticing that, for instance, your coworker is getting calls or their ex-boyfriend is, is showing up at work constantly to, to keep an eye on them, and you have some concerns there may be a, a DV issue going on, that's something that um, if, if your workforce is trained properly and aware, they will know to go to HR. 
Um, if it's a supervisory employee who has knowledge of a domestic violence situation that perhaps is affecting the employee's ability to attend work every day, or they may need an accommodation like I talked about earlier, you are certainly under a, an obligation um, under not only the domestic violence leave law, but many of the other laws I talked about earlier to um, engage in a process where you're uh, determining what kinds of accommodations that employee uh, may need, um, offering you know, EAP assistance, offering perhaps to change their work phone number. There are a whole host of things you, that you can do in that regard. Can I add something? Sure. Um, so, you know, one of, the, one of the human things that you can do as bystanders, we talk about this all the time on the awareness front, is as bystanders, we all have an obligation to help, right? Domestic violence is everyone's problem. So the idea is that if you work in an area, the simplest thing to do is to get acclimated or just know what the domestic violence agency is in your area, right? And have that number on hand, right? A pamphlet, something, or anything that you can offer someone. Mm -hmm. If you suspect something is going on, you're not going to them saying, you know, maybe they don't, really don't want HR to get involved. Maybe they don't, they are not ready to, 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 to get or receive help. But if you offer them um, a number to FCR, to any one of the agencies throughout the state of Massachusetts, when they get to their breaking point, which a lot of us as victims have to get to, right? We've, we've, we've got to the point where no more. We're not at the point where we're like, okay, it's not that bad, and I don't want to get anybody else involved because it's really not that bad. I mean, he hasn't beat me enough. He hasn't hurt me enough. I mean, it's just verbal assaults. It's not that serious. And I have to take care of the kids. And I, he has to take care of the bills. You know, all of these things that culminate that say, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I, I'm run out ready for help. If you offer um, an agency hotline number, they can pick up the phone and call when they're ready. It's as simple as that sometimes. Right. So um, I agree with everything that I'm, oh, that's my issue. <laughs> I agree with everything that everyone else has said. But again, just being, just doing the healing thing sometimes is more than enough. Which is so much about the culture in your workplace. Yeah. It really is. Uh, let's open it up for questions. What kind of questions might you have for the panel? Yes, sir. Go ahead. So I'm an employment uh, counselor for an agency that works with um, homeless or potentially homeless <coughs> individuals and families. We come across instances where clients will intentionally leave resume gaps or take out experience on their resume or, or their interview process because it was during the time of DV and they don't want to talk about it. So. How would you coach me coaching them as far as, you know, um, when they're interviewing for a job, you know, how do they deal with that with the DV um, talk? Thank you. Yeah, who would like to take that? <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, would you, so, yeah, go ahead. So I, I can, uh, that is a really good question. I mean, as we all know, uh, employers looking at candidates for jobs don't like seeing gaps in your resume and um, you know I'm not sure if the people you've spoken to are, are just a lot of things are triggered um, by thinking about that time in their lives or perhaps they were fired because they had attendance issues um, for taking time off to, to deal with the the abuse and court dates, for instance. Um, you know, I I would think that just not in, as with my lawyer hat on, but um, from an employer's perspective generally, I, I wouldn't necessarily leave off um, a, a job on the resume, you know, unless it was, you know, a very short stint. And of course, a lot of job applications you're, you're signing it at the bottom saying that you're giving it an accurate account of your job history. So there's also that risk of um, later an employer finding out maybe you left something out and drop, uh, uh, leaping to conclusions that uh -huh. you must have done something absolutely horrendous there. So it might be easier to address it up front, um, you know, and, and, and 
you know, a lot of employers, if they, if they know what they're doing, they're not going to ask questions that will necessarily elicit um, your, your personal background. So if you're not comfortable, um, I wouldn't see why in an interview um, you would necessarily, um, you know, need to bring up your past um, marital or uh, issues or things like that. But but it is definitely a good question, and I, I do empathize with, you know, how co complex these decisions are. Who else? Who else has a question? Yes, ma'am. Um, just curious for what things might you suggest people should consider um, if the abuse is happening between two employees in the same or, or that that was an area of right yeah. that I wanted to get into and wasn't sure we'd have time because it, and, and Jennifer I know you and I have been on these panels together and we've talked about this before but there is a possibility that the perpetrator is on the staff oh, right. is in the building so what kinds of steps do you take and maybe Tom is that something that you could address sure I can I can touch on some of it some of the the legal, the legal piece of it um, is a little more challenging. Mm -hmm. um, but if the abuse is occurring between, if, if, if the logical question is, is one of them a superior to the other? Because um, that makes a difference. Um, uh, because if they're um, manager, um, then that complicates it. Um, there are certain obligations that an employer will have. Um, but what the employee, you're asking what should the, the employee do. I, I would, again, the, depending on the size of your organization, if you have a human resources department, um, and, and it depends on the, the avenues that are available, but they, they should go to human resources and, and talk with their human resources person about what's going on. And, and that, it, it's really, you, you're, you're not going to stop it if, if there's no lack of awareness about it. Um, and, and then there are certain obligations that an employer will have at that point as well. Um, your policies will make a difference as well, depending on what, what the employer's policies are. Um, if, if they have policies where there can't be dating and that type of thing. Um, so there's a lot of, it's kind of multifaceted, um, uh, but I, I would suggest going to human resources, talking with them about it, explaining what the issue is. If there's workplace violence that's going on, there should be a zero tolerance for workplace violence, mm -hmm. um, zero. And there should be an obligation, every company should have a policy that says you have an obligation to report any violence in the workplace. Um, and so it's everybody completely understands what that responsibility is. So I don't know if you have any there, there has to be some level of, um, you know, even if the perpetrator is within your building, they have rights as well, correct? I mean, if they have to make court appearances, they have to do these kinds of things. Is that part of the law that they are given that time? Well, the, the perpetrators of domestic violence uh, are not protected by the DV statute. But that is kind of putting the cart before the horse because the, the question that comes up is, okay, there are two employees that are in some relationship or were in a relationship one is claiming to have suffered abuse by the other, but how are, how is the employer to know, um, as with any allegation, like I was sexually assaulted by my coworker or uh, sexually harassed, with, with any allegations, you know, HR needs uh, or outside counsel um, needs to do an independent investigation, but, you know, before taking one person's side over the other, um, and you know, in some cases, as an immediate response, you could uh, perhaps separate the uh, the two so that they don't have to work um, together. And uh, there is a very fact specific process, but um, while you're investigating, you could separate them. Um, you could, uh, you know try to get as much information as you can to verify whether um, one employee is ab abusing the other. Certainly Tom is right that if the um, alleged perpetrator is a supervisor, that really is uh, dangerous for the company from a strict liability um, perspective. Uh, so, you know, the, 
the investigation is going to be complicated though, right? Because what we know about uh, perpetrators and abusers is they are often some of the most charming, articulate people that you'll ever meet and would never suspect of having uh, engaged in any kind of uh, verbal or physical violence. So it is um, not an easy scenario, um, particularly when you have the, the articular perpetrator and then the, the victim or survivor uh, often is, is going un under so much um, stress, pain, <laughs> etc., that um, they're anxious, they, they may not necessarily come across as able to calmly and articulately explain what's happening. So to that point, I would say um, keep start keeping a log, a log of dates and times that things happen, um, that you can then, mm -hmm. that employee can then backtrack to, um, so that they can then really you know, go back to a specific time and date that this happened and, you know, help, it can help. Every employer should have, have, have we mentioned it, a harassment policy. I mean, and, and that actually should articulate and spell out exactly what the process is for an investigation. And, and it, it is, the question is actually pretty complicated because it's got, it can go in a lot of different directions. But if, if every organization should have a, a, a harassment policy that, that sort of defines the steps and, and there should be a, a designated officer or person that's responsible for conducting that, that investigation. So, um, but the most important thing is coming forward and, and reporting it. How about other questions? Yes. Um, my background, and I have my students here with me, is in mental health. And so I really wanted to make sure that I was clear about that so when we go back to the campus we can talk about this. Um, it is my understanding that, like in a corporate kind of setting, if you were to take FMLA because you needed time to process through your anxiety, your depression, the, the pain and suffering you experienced after dealing on your own outside of your employer with this issue, right? You take FMLA, that's unpaid. Is that correct, right? It can be paid, but there is no requirement that it is Most paid employers won't pay it. Right, like a, a lot don't. Okay, <laughs> so it, 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 again, depends on the employer, but yeah. the employer can choose or use it as up to their discretion. Yeah. Okay, so my understanding that a lot of employers don't pay for this, right? And more so, I, I wonder about employers that I've worked with or experience I've seen with um, as a psychologist and seeing kind of this issue happen that even when you have short term disability, because it's not a medical issue. Because people that suffer from the damage afterwards is mental health. Right. Mental health is not covered. Mm -hmm. So we still are in a position where women that walk away, victims, they're still put in a position where the whole burden is put on them. Yeah, yeah. and there's no financial, like, legally, there isn't, like, the employer doesn't have to pay. FMLA really is not going to protect you. The Domestic Violence Leave Act is great. But financially, if you do have this family to take care of, if you are the breadwinner and you want to walk away, we still in 2018 aren't making sure this is, is funded for someone. That's what we're still saying at this conference. Like, it depends on the short term disability you have. Our company, for example, does cover mental health. Mm -hmm. yeah. We just have someone that had anxiety and depression and was out for two months and short term disability to pay for 60% of their salary. But Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. You're right. I mean, employers should absolutely be, res be responsive to that. Um, mm -hmm. We do. Um, we have sick time. We have short-term disability, and our short-term disability will cover that. Um, so it's it's it, it really is a response. You're right. Legally, they're not obligated to do it, but more progressive employers that care about their their employees will do it. And I, I think more and more employers are doing it. So. Go ahead. I just want to add, though, if in the state of Massachusetts you lose your job due to domestic violence and you have enough quarters in, you're entitled to unemployment. We just need to mention the domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. uh, in Massachusetts and many other states, if uh, domestic violence played a role in your ultimate separation from the company, 
um, you will be entitled to uh, obtain uh, unemployment compensation benefits, which is huge since, as we all know, like the perpetrator of domestic abuse w often wants to obtain, uh, keep that control over mm -hmm. the victim by uh, fi financial control being one of those aspects. So if a survivor is attempting to leave, but somehow um, she's terminated from her job, she should, uh, you know, he or she should apply for unemployment benefits, um, but also, as we know, that there are a host of, of laws um, that if the employer has not been, been paying attention to these issues and has taken some missteps with respect to the laws, um, perhaps she even uh, has a basis for a legal claim. Yes, we're gonna. This will have to unfortunately be our last question. Go right ahead. Are all these laws that are in place uh, strictly focused on the physical symptoms of domestic violence, or are there laws to really recognize the psychological abuse? Because as we've stated, that they do go unnoticed. Kelly, I can take that, and you can. So, are are you talking about relating to the workplace or covering just domestic violence in general? I guess like both, like in the workplace and then in general, like what what is these institutions doing for the psychological aspect of domestic violence? So, do you want to start? Sure, I can start off with that. So, um, it, this goes back to something I touched on earlier where, um, you know, there, as we all know, domestic violence, you know, comes in not just the form of physical abuse, but also uh, emotional and verbal abuse, and uh, the symptoms can range from you know, physical symptoms to, uh, you know, mental health issues. So, regardless of whether you're, you've been a victim of domestic violence, you know, employers are obligated if, if they, um, uh, if an employee asks for an accommodation, for instance, to take intermittent leave to go to counseling, just as one example, or if you, as an employer, should know that that person needs an accommodation. For instance, maybe they've mentioned in a comment that they've had some problems at home and, and they're uh, absent a lot. You put two and two together, and if you should know that you should ask, hey, is there anything I can do for you to, um, to help you, you know, per perform your job, any anything I can do to help, like the EAP program, or do you need time off to sort out these issues, whether it's FMLA or even if FMLA doesn't apply um, under the state and federal disability laws, you you may be obligated to give them time off or a flexible schedule, for instance, um, to uh, help them um, do what they need to do to be able to perform their jobs. And it is a very fact-specific question, um, uh, but generally speaking, um, that would be the process. You would need to engage in an interactive process with the person to see what their needs are, um, you know, whether it's a disability that's um, mental or uh, emotional in nature or, or physical. It's largely it's covered under the ADA. Mm -hmm. um, it's physical or mental disability that substantially limits someone's work life uh, or, or uh, major life function. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, essentially that it's, mm -hmm. it would be covered so unfortunately, our time has come to an end. I knew this would happen. It is just, uh, again, it's such a complex issue, and it's fascinating. I want to thank our panel uh, for being here. Laverne Gordon, Kelly Dwyer, Tom Kernan, and Jennifer Duke. Thank you guys very, very much. Pat, thank you for having all of us. I'm going to turn it over to you. I also want to thank all the panelists and Kim Kerrigan, who I think does a fabulous job in making sure all of this goes so smoothly. Um, the information that we all received this afternoon has been, I think, phenomenal. Um, I did put some on the back table, copies of Family and Community Resources. 
um, domestic violence policy that's in our employers employees handbook they seem to have all gone um, if somebody would like a copy I'm happy to share that with you it's been vetted by a very good law firm so it's all nice and legal um, because it's always easier to when you have one you can just sort of look at um, I also wanted to bring up a point that none of us do this work in isolation that you know the, my wonderful staff that are here today who are on the front lines all the time have many colleagues in the community that we work with that all of these people can reach out and you can have survivors reach out we have the department of transitional assistance here the brockton police department is here a representative from the brockton housing authority from the district attorney's office um, you know, and students from Stonehill who last week, I think it was, you all put together wonderful bags of um, personal care items for the survivors who come to the agency. So thank you very much for doing that. Because it takes all of us, if we're going to someday see an end to violence in our homes, to make that happen. In the meantime, take everything that you learned today, take the brochures, if nothing else, if you know somebody, if you think somebody, has violence in their home or in their relationship, just leave the brochure. Because at some point they may fold it up, they may put it in their shoe, they may put it in the back of their wallet. But trust me, at some point they're gonna pick that up. And remind those survivors that you work with, and for you, for the employers, and for the, the law enforcement and everybody else, all of the services at agencies like Family and Community Resources for Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Survivors are free. There is no charge. They don't have to go to your EA department. They don't have to have billable third-party insurance. They don't need any of us. They just need to pick up the phone and call. If you want to call us first and ask us what kind of information, please do that. We have 24-hour hotlines. You can get the answer anytime you want. I know time is short. Um, but I just want again thank you and I just need to tell you I am so thrilled I actually counted the number of men in this room and it's more than when we went to Boston. So congratulations Brockton and go Red Sox.